A, lecture on emotions. Yeah? And so everything you need to know about regulating emotions is right here. All right, we will see you next time. <laughs> that's it. And believe it or not, that's kind of how I was taught. It's always a riddle, and you leave someone around. Okay. So that's breath. It's all about breath. And that's what we're really going to talk about, is how your emotions are revealed in your breath and how controlling your breath and regulating your breath is the secret. You know, the autonomic nervous system going into the sympathetic nervous system and that relationship between the conscious and the unconscious mind and how the body reacts to stress uh, and any other emotion. But all of the emotions trigger this release of, simply put, death hormones. And so there's, a, there's so much that I, I, I can... I'd like to share with you. I have an hour and a half to share over 30 years of information. So, you know, I'm going to hit you with a fire hose and be, be, you know, just be patient with me on this. So, we all have our favorite emotion, you'll notice. And you'll notice about people you, you, you know and love. We have our go-to emotion. Uh, that's an interesting topic that I want to address. Uh, how it affects the physical body is another topic I'd like to address. And how we could, you're not going to get rid of emotions. That wouldn't be a good plan in anyways, because we're not a bunch of Vulcans or something. We want to experience life. But it would be nice if we can keep the light side of the expression, you know, and know that when that dark side shows up, it's more like a, like a barometer to say, hey, wow, check this out, the pressure's changing. And maybe we can use that as opposed to being used by the emotion. So what I'd like to share with you is the concept of wind. And that's why I use the flute. And the flute in itself, those notes that I played are actually and specifically five notes. And those five notes are basically your pentatonic scale. And so, you know, fear actually belongs to an A if you want to get all technical about this. Each one of these emotions has a base note. Okay, but with that note, there's a vibration. So every note, of course, is a vibration. And every vibration affects a very specific organ in the human body. So by understanding how this whole system is connected, we'll never really change it, but we can coexist with it. This is the Tao, it's reality, you're not really in it be able to completely change it, but you can certainly, you know, coexist within it. So what I'd like to talk to you about is how emotions and wind are very much the same and how we can look at this tree as an example and say, okay, the fear leaf, if you will, is the blue leaf. It actually affects the kidneys, it affects the bladder, it affects the endocrine system, and I can go on and on. If you stay in a constant, like a slow burn of fear for decades, which most of us will stay with this allostatic load for decades. Anger is the liver, it's the gallbladder, it's the eyes, it's connective tissue. Stress, excess, is the heart, you know, a small intestine, the circulatory system. Worry is going to be the stomach, the pancreas, the spleen, and a grief is going to be the lungs, a large intestine, you know, I go on and on and on with body parts. And this is why I say this, because it gets even crazier. Based on your physical constitution, you're going to have a go-to emotion that you use first. And, and this is going to sound really simple, but generally speaking, a round shape face or body is going to react with fear. Okay, and, I mean, and you don't have to remember all of this. I'm just trying to illustrate a point. Uh, a rectangular shaped body is going to react with aggression and rage. Yeah. A uh, diamond face or heart shaped face or body is going to go ahead with excess, the excessively excited 
you know, and stress type person. Uh, triangle shaped person, meaning the jawbone is wider than the ears, or the hip bones are wider than the shoulders. That's an earth body, and that's going to uh, be dominated by, or the go to emotion or first emotion is going to be worry. And then when we look at the square, that is going to be metal, and that's going to be grief. Tends to be grief. Now, how do I know this? This is based on traditional Chinese medicine. It's a system that's thousands of years, thousands of years old. And when we take it in clients, we do a physical assessment and diagnosis, and we can tell by your body shape, generally, pretty reliably, what your go-to is. You might not even know it, but that's what happens. And that's okay, because there's also a strength, because this one, this also connects to intuition and wisdom. So once you can balance it, there's two sides to every coin, the yin-yang principle. This one, yeah, sure, it's anger, but it can also be heroic and right action. You know, this one, yes, it's stress, but it can also be unbelievable, you know, love, joy. This one, yes, worry, but it can also be acquired information, the ability to, you know, understand and find the balance in the situation. And then this one, grief, yeah, but it's also integrity, you know. So it's not like they're bad. It's the only bad part is not knowing. It's really the not knowing that creates this suffering. So when we look at these emotions, based on your physical constitution, you're going to have this propensity. And that's fine, but then you're going to do this for decades. And you're not going to know that that's how you roll. That's your personality. Some people react in fear, some people react in anger, some people react, you know them, probably hopefully by now and know yourself. You know, I have a rectangular face, uh, or pardon me, a square, but like that kind of, you know. So I tend to uh, react in uh, aggression and rage, or I used to, I mean still every once in a while, but generally speaking, you know, that's going to be my thing. But also I'm the first guy to stand up and you know, try to protect the situation. So there's positive and negative. You start to kind of know yourself and know your behavior. That's a big piece because we don't want to get rid of emotions. We just want to make sure that the emotions don't control us. So by understanding a little bit about yourself, that's why when we go through this program, this type of training, identifying your constitution. We look at your physical constitution. We also look at even your age, believe it or not, has an elemental you know, a period. Yeah. This is a zero to eight, you formed your ego. That was the springtime of your life. Then from uh, eight to 33, that was your flowering. Oh, look at me. This is what I'm going to be. You're at your most beautiful. From 33 to 58, that's earth. That's when you kind of stabilize the mundane. You can take care of all the stuff, your education, your home, your family, the stuff. Then you start to get in to 58 to 83, and that's metal. And this is the period of fall when it's imperative to cut away everything that is not and does not serve you. It's real important because your resistance is kind of low. So you really want to start to take the alchemical process of turning this lead to gold. They call this period of life the alchemist. And then from 83 to 108 is the sage. That's really when you are well past this taking all the lessons from the hard knocks of your life, transforming it into gold, if you will, and enriching the lives of others. The most powerful time in your life to have an influence beyond the acquisition of form is actually from that 83 on forward, because you're the wise elder. This the higher meaning and purpose of life. Building a bigger portfolio or getting a larger investment in your life, that the stuff that's going to be more like what did you leave behind and what kind of ripple or karmic, you know, reaction is following. So these are all very important phases of life. And you'll notice that there's even uh, the emotions tend to fit with these years, these seasons. So what we want to realize is that, okay, we're going to take these, we're going to make them all little leaves, we're going to move over to here and we're going to put them on a tree. And then what we're going to say, life, the movement, is wind. So things happen. Life happens, and the wind begins to spiral, and the wind begins to move. 
and every leaf on the tree moves and every branch on the tree moves and what happens is as you sit here we tend to identify ourselves as the branches and leaves and with that we're the unstable it's in a constant state of flux and if you follow it you're going to be in a very unstable stage when in fact yeah but this is if we look at the tree itself the root power is where it's at so you big big part of the teaching and the, uh, the jump here is to identify yourself as the root and the trunk not the branches and the leaves the branches and the leaves come on every year they fall it's completely impermanent so a form of insanity is to base long-term emotions and actions on an impermanent situation which we do all the time because it's hard it's hard to see you know beyond anything but your experience of your emotions when we call that losing yourself and losing your root so a lot of the work that we do inside of this practice is let's say upgrading our self-concept or upgrading our sense of self and realizing that yes these emotions and these branches are part of me but they're very impermanent they're constantly changing they constantly break away from the root of the whole tree. If you're in a constant state of following these emotions, they, you're going to be, okay, I'm hungry. Okay, I'm tired. Okay, I need to stand. Okay, I need to sit. Okay, it doesn't stop. You'll be led around completely by what they call your true nature. And that is usually uh, eradicated in theory during this stage, during wood, during the tree. And that's what we try to teach the baby, right? I don't want to play with this, so he whips the block across the room. I've got to go to the washroom. I've got to do this. I'm hungry, right? We, but we, we only go so far in the evolution of, okay, I'm not my emotions. I'm what's experiencing my emotions. So we start to identify ourselves with these emotions. And then it gets better. Then we, again, start to find a special combination of emotions that we use. I'm a rage guy. I'll smash the desk. In. Yeah, so now you even start to defend the behavior because it becomes part of your self-concept. Your eyes are looking at this, so your ego says that's me. And in order to change that coping method, you have to go through what they call ego death. And it's just as scary as death. So you will fight tooth and nail to hang on to the right to act out on these emotions. Because that's who you are. I'm not changing who I am. And it's really a form of unconscious insanity that we're all subject to. So the, the real work, the, the ground of this whole process is stepping back, as this little dude does, and ask yourself, are you the emotions or are you that which are experiencing the emotions? Are you the leaves and the branches or are you the trunk and the roots? So there's this period where we try to, let's say, upgrade our perspective, our sense of self. And just that piece of information, realizing that these emotions are in a state of constant flux. They refer to that as a true reaction, your true feelings. And we've learned as adults, you know, uh, you might be there with, a six-year-old kid and he might start saying this is boring and he's stupid right and you be like stop stop you might be feeling the same way but you've learned right <laughs> to at least cut that piece you can't constantly go by your true you know reaction and imprint so we've learned that so that we can basically function on a confucian let's say civil manner but not really especially when it gets bad if you start standing online line too long you start Guy, will she ever? And there she is at the ATM machine trying to figure it out. 20 minutes into it, and the eight, the car goes in and out. Right? We've seen it. And so now all of a sudden, it starts to bumble. It really goes. It really goes. And now you lose. And you really start identifying with the root, or pardon me, the, the leaf. So the work is, the big piece of this is identifying really that which is permanent, that which is truly you. That aspect of you that has been here before your life situation and will be here after your life situation and we call that the constant I am 
you know, that real highest level of your human expression. The other piece, this is all very animalistic reaction. It's emotion. And it never ends. In traditional Chinese medicine, they would call this Hun, H-U-N, and Po, P-O. Again, technical terms you don't have to remember. But the Hun animal, or pardon me, the Po animal, you know? And then there's the Hun human. And so we find if you don't get enough discipline in this period, through the balance of yin and yang, usually a masculine and feminine presence in the home, this part is never curtailed. So you go through life primarily as a, a poe animal. And you find yourself usually in a cage. And that's where, you know, if you want to go down to the root cause of crime. And that's because a poe has never really been addressed. What are we trying to address? It goes down to going in and developing the discipline. And it's not a control mechanism of discipline, of disciplining your emotions. It's really a liberation. And really saying, I have the power to see who I truly am in this situation and not get lost in the emotional moment. And that's where all of the failure in our life came from, at least in mine, losing myself in the emotional moment. That's just what it is. So we have almost the responsibility to step back a little bit and say, I see. So I have my higher self, my constant, and then I have this, you know, that which is experienced the moment to moment reality. That is fine, but, you know, I think, therefore, I am, that's false. I am, therefore, I think. In other words, you perceive your thoughts, you're not your thoughts. So there has to be this line created, and we'll go into all of the tools we can use to start to establish or maybe even upgrade the view, or maybe create a little bit of space between your emotions and your actions. And that's a big one. So what happens is at first, it's pretty much we identify ourselves in everything that we can see, the world of form. We cannot understand that the real power and the real sense of who you are is that which you cannot see. Right? Makes sense. If you took a corpse, is that you? No. That's what's left of you. It's not you until the consciousness is in there. The part we can't see is the part that makes it you. But we spend our whole life identifying with the part we can see, and every once in a while when things get really bad, we drop down and really take a look at ourselves. Because the hardest thing in this room for you to see right now is your own face. That's nature. And that's why, you know, mirrors always had such a mystical thing, you know, in the old, old days, because it's hard to get over the mirror. The reflection, getting a ref good reflection of who you are is the most difficult thing for all of us. It takes a lot of courage, and you have to be very, very, very familiar with the fact that, well, this is me, and the reflection I'm receiving about my behavior is just by action, but it's not me. So then you can have space, because now I'm not going through ego death, as you point out, or give me an honest reflection. True words are seldom kind. Kind words are seldom true. And so that's Lao Tzu, he said that. And so that certain level, we, we live in a world where everything is so politically correct, the last thing we want to see is the truth. We want to just go ahead and have this experience, which is all the world of form, all in permanent, all in a constant state of flux and decay. But it's movement, it's mind movement. It's, it's, it's really addressing a universal hunger. We all have a hunger. So we go down our iPhone, we do this, we pick up a call and call Jenny, we do, we just, ah, it's a hunger, it's a hunger. But what we don't understand is, we don't even know, we don't know, like a baby crying. It's hungry, but it doesn't know it needs milk, it just knows it's in pain. So it takes action, it cries, it kicks, it throws its stuff. The parent says, oh, I see it needs milk. Well, we don't even know that the hunger is actually a hunger for truly knowing yourself. Because once you know yourself, there's this sense of peace and harmony and tranquility. The pensiveness, I'm in a cage walking back and forth, drops. But we don't. We have to spend these periods of life knowing our career, knowing others, knowing how to pay bills, knowing how to show up in time, even knowing our language, 
to really spend little time knowing ourselves. So the emotional reaction is just completely unconscious. The time to stop and reflect, especially from 58 to 83, is your most important career. We take career real serious because we gotta pay bills and buy a house. But really, understanding yourself and realizing the nature of yourself is ultimately where the hunger is, is ultimately fed. It's an interesting piece because it creates this stirring, more wind. What do I mean by wind? Let's look at wind, we can upgrade it as motion. Isn't wind motion? That's how you can tell wind is happening. You can see trees moving, you can see grass moving, you can see signs bending, motion. So, wind is in motion. Emotion, emotion, it's the same. It's wind. It's mind movement, which goes back to my silly little flute. So learning how to regulate this wind is an imperative piece. So let's talk about that for a second. Okay, if I say something funny, you go, ha, ha, ha. Right? And I can hear it in your breath. If I say something kind of cheesy and you're all, Ugh. right? Whatever I say, however you react, whichever one of these emotions, will be, if you grief, you'll cry. <laughs> Sobbing, right? This excess is, you know, joy. Ah, yeah. You know, we all know that person. Every one of us has, right? But they all are expressed in breath. Even if you're in a negotiation and you're trying to stay cool because you really want them to buy this old beater of yours, you don't want them to know that the transmission's been sawdust in it. <laughs> but the, 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 the breath will give you away every time. That's what I do. I just watch. I just look kind of nothing. and I just watch your chest and I watch your breath and that tells me what's happening. Your breath will never lie. And so to regulate the breath is to regulate the wind, which is the regulates the turbidity and what's happening to this tree. And all of you have your favorite leaf. But enough wind knocks every one of these puppies down. You'll have your first one. Sure, this is my go-to emotion, whatever your deal is. <coughs> but at a certain point, all of these emotions will be stirred by the wind. So what we have to understand is, okay, let's look at this objectively. I think my human experience is very unique special, I'm unique and special, and you are, but we're all having the same experience. And it's called the human condition, and it's a constant battle between the branches and the roots. So by finding, it's like if you identify yourself as these branches and leaves, you're going to be in a constant state of flux, a constant state of emotion in motion. Okay. Well, you can get away with that until about 58. Well, you really can. But it'll start blowing you out at 58. If you spend 20 years dealing with the stress of closing that deal, close, 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 one of the projections at the end of the year, the, the general manager of uh, Cadillac in Vegas, which was my brother. And by the time he was 50, he had adrenal failure, heart failure, he had to retire. He actually killed himself with adrenaline. And it's because you can get away with it here and there, but see, we're not. When you start triggering the sympathetic nervous system, everything's like, uh-oh, fight or flight. There's a tiger in the village. Ah! Well, then what happens is all of the standard, let's say, maintenance of the body is put on hold so that you could run. You're not going to start thinking about cleaning lymph waste when you're about to be eaten by a tiger, right? I mean, if you think it does make sense. And so we are designed to say, oh, bro, and now you get into the cortisol dump and it saves your life. You know, your heart's beating, your muscles, you're a little quicker. God bless. But here's the problem. We live in a world now where, in a couple hundred years ago, there might be two or three traumatic events in your village during your lifetime. Yeah, there was that flood. 
oh yeah, the elephants ran through, or whatever, and you're like, wow, you know, even if you lost half the village, okay, but that happened two or three times in a life that you actually dump this cortisol. The way we live now with the information and just the simple movement of stress, we stay in a constant state of the village being overrun by elephants. It's a constant state. And you stay that way for 20 years. So if you're Mr. Fire, fire Guy, your arteries are so stiff and so ripped apart that stroke and heart attack, that you're just waiting for it. You have ravaged everything that belongs to this part of your physical body because that's how you roll when you deal with stress. This guy died of pancreatic cancer. First, as your mother told you, kill worry yourself sick. And she was right. We call it Aja. <laughs> and it's true because if you sit there and you worry, you get a stomach ache. Isn't it the truth? That stomach belongs to worry, guys. Okay, well, you can worry because, you know, Uncle Joe didn't make it back from the airport and you haven't seen him in years. You can do that. But if you worry for 20 years, once you're done burning a hole in your stomach lining, you're on your way to your pancreas. Because it goes from hollow to solid organs. It kind of works its way merrily into you. So we can handle a boost of, ah, and that's cool. And we're designed, and the, you know, the intelligent design is it's amazing. But we don't. We keep doing it for decades. And that's why by 58, you're done. That's why the average life expectancy is 58. Is, right? Not too long ago. That's why they, you know, you retire at 55 because you'll be dead in three years. <laughs> to their war, you're still here. You're golfing and stuff. When you guys die, the whole system's going to break. So, but they'll have the, the, the life expectancy is like 83. And now they're saying 100, right, for some of the boomers. But the generation, the millennials, is back down to 58. Yeah, because we're going to lose a generation, they call it. Yeah, they'll die much younger. And so, yeah, they did very good at culling the species. There's 8 billion. Do we really need them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you were just, I know it's sad. I know I didn't make this. But if you wanted to look at on that, you know, the powers that are responsible for keeping this crazy thing going, it's a mess. Because what we've done is we've used allopathic medicine to extend the life. And then your groovy hippies are starting to show up. You know, they're not burning bras anymore. So they're like, okay, I'll do yoga. So now what's going to happen is there's going to hopefully be a blend of allopathic for really you know, deep concerns. But general chronic lifestyle stuff will be able to address through like wellness things like this, silly little lectures and doing some breath work. So you can basically extend that life and not break the system. They tried it in China. They tried uh, during the, the, you know, after the, the revolution. Like, yeah, all things China got to go. They love to do that. They love to destroy. When you want to get, get rid of a country, destroy its culture, remove its monuments, and remove its national pride. And that's what they did. And then they're like, um, you know, okay, oops. They couldn't afford it the allopathic way. They just couldn't afford it. And so uh, they're like, hmm, maybe we'll have them do Tai Chi in the park? Yeah, that's it. So if you go there and you say you have an ulcer and you say you have stress and you have planters, you have all these little silly things that we've scripted out and then, oh, you know, all of the opioids for the, yeah, here's a card. You're going to get 100 stamps on this card. Go to any park, there's a government official doing the Tai Chi 24 and Qigong. If you go through 100 classes and you still have that condition, we may write a script. But 80% of the time, it treats it. And that's so they had to kind of like, uh oh, we got to go back and recover the China thing. And that's where they came up with the Barefoot Doctor movement and the Chinese uh, Beijing Wushu Standard Course. And, and these are the things I, you know, studied and certified in. And it was about, okay, how do we keep the people without going bankrupt? You know, actively involved in self-care. Self so we're experiencing that right now with our health care retirement. And funny thing is, the generation before us, most disease was brought on by malnutrition. Yeah. 
Now it's brought on by stress. Drugs. Yeah, well, sure, that's what we're doing. You know, we're trying to treat that. We're trying to treat the external with external. You cannot fix the body with the body, per se. You can fix it with the mind. You cannot fix the mind with the mind. You can fix it with the body. It's a weird yin yang flip. And so we're starting. We're starting to do this. I'll tell you, uh, in 1987, I uh, opened my first center. And I don't know, I'd have to give away a free car to fill this room. You know, come on, and someone's going to win a free car. Because <laughs> no one was into it. No one was into it. I'd be up here talking about witchcraft, as far as they're concerned. So I've watched a big jump in the collective, let's say, receptivity and awareness of the concept that, oh, really? Maybe I can be a little more involved in passively waiting for someone to fix me. So that is really, really, I mean, you're just proof of it. And so what I'm trying to share with you is it's like a secret that I really spent a lot of my time. I started this in 78, and I lived with my teacher, humbly slept on the floor, and was abused beyond belief to learn this stuff. Because back then, you couldn't learn it. There was nowhere to learn it, except maybe you can find some grandmaster. And so my hope is, all right, maybe I can really share this, kind of streamline it so it's a little Western, more Western, so you can get it. And then take it, make the change. And the change is first in your perspective. You are not your emotions. I'm mad. No, you're not. You're experiencing anger, but you're not mad. You're you. It's simple. I'm sad. You're not sad. You're experiencing sorrow, but you're you. So stop this I am that. You're not. I wasn't, we weren't even allowed. You're, you're not even your stuff. That's my car. You know it's not. It's the car you drive. Well, this is my house. Actually, it isn't. It's the house you live in. When I lived with, I lived with my teacher, it was so hard. I was not allowed to say my stuff. Not even my silly Taoist robe. This is the robe you wear. Okay. Nothing. And he was trying to break me of the Western paradigm of materialism, which is ultimately identifying with leaves, all things in permanent, and branches, all things that will fall away, all distractions, constant flux, not you, subject to the wind, blinding you from your root power of who you really are. And so, but basically, this wind has an effect only when you think you're the leaves and the branches. So the real work is to assemble the ability to see the root of your nature. It's, okay. You're not going to do it today, but there's what they call a mind seal moment when a piece of information forever changes your perspective. And that's all it takes. It's called a seed. If you plant a seed, you're not going to have corn tonight, but you will have corn. And the first step is planting the seed and starting to, especially after 58, because this is all, and, and, and nature tries to show you that from 58 to 83. All things fall away. Your skin changes, which belongs to metal. All the stuff. And this is a hard time. This is why a lot of us die in that period. Because all of which we held valuable is going to fall away. And if you want to be the sage from 83 to 108, sharing the wisdom of the real definition of reality, uh, you got to realize that that's on you. And the first step <laughs> is those emotions are. Now we can say, well, the emotions, hmm, they're deep-seated. Sometimes, you know, you'll have a disproportionate emotional reaction to something. It's just how it is. I have a disproportionate emotional reaction to cutting a tube by four. I, I do. I was, as a child, we built the house I lived in, my family they built. I hate it. I associate it with work during summer vacation. I associate it with oppression. I, so I just hate it. So, and I'm good at it. That's the worst part. You know, <laughs> and my whole family, we, I built three houses up in the ashram. Some of you have been in them. You know, we, I can do it. But 
if I can't get that 40, my brother will call up 22 degree angle on the thing, and I did it 25, and he'll throw it back up me. I'll take the skill saw and throw it off the road. I actually will. And I'll lose my mind immediately. And he's like, dude, aren't you like the Zen guy? Like, Whatever. I can't do it. You know? And so, and that was a $200 crosscut saw. And, well, because it's disproportionate. I'm not really mad at that, but literally in my cellular memory, I have a story. And you just, you know, open one page of that book and I, the whole book goes through my head. So I'm reacting to 20 years of what I perceived as, you know, being overworked and underpaid. I have no patience for it. That's why I do this. <laughs> you know, I'm very patient. So, so I know that about my nature, you know, and it's like, yeah, I can be a little aggressive. And that's cool. But it's really not that 22 degree angle cut that got me. It's just I've got a raw nerve right here. And it's just not working out. And by the time you're this age, I'm sure you all do. You have that piece that you've endured. And so that's the piece you have to kind of balance with and know. Know that about yourself. So you, and you can slowly, what I did is I just, I'm not in that industry. I'd be dead. You can slowly, you know, uh, recreate your reality to better accommodate your true nature. This is where we're at. Now, a lot of you are deep in your reality. And so it's really about, really about accommodating your true nature. There's techniques we can do. So let's talk about this. This piece, your true nature, is the hardest thing in the world to see. So... What do we need? We need what they call tranquility. The only time you're really going to have a clear view, and you know what? You know this. Here you are. You're trying to put this thing together. It's a, like my kid. He gets this train. It's 800 pieces. It's a box this big. You know, it's a book on how to put it together. You know, and I'm like, so there you are. It's 2 in the morning. And what do you do before you crumble up the, you go like this. Right? We've all had that moment, so we intuitively know before you blow your stack, which implies more air, we will breathe. So regulating breath is the door into the nervous system because it's a part of and the only organ. The lungs and colon interact directly with the world, and you have control over it. Right? Otherwise, you soil your pants as you sat here and suffocate. So it would end poorly. So that's the, for the system that gets you in. That's called pro-organs, actually. So the way you can have an actual effect on your whole nervous system is regulating breath. If we regulate breath, we regulate the emotions. So we want to get an honest reflection of our truest self. Once you can see yourself, then you start to cultivate, and this isn't you know, narcissistic, but self-love. Because all of the acting out, we call it turbidity, hatred, crime, and insanity in the world that we live in right now, is based on self-hate. Because you never really see the beauty of what you really are. All you see is maybe your social class, maybe your race, maybe your gender, maybe your car, maybe your, that's all bullshit. And it's very shallow and it's a moving target. So you never really cultivate the root of self love. And so as you start to really see your awesomeness, you start to drop into that and you're not as easily moved by the external world. But we live in a world that's so go, 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 go. You're not going to find that at university. You're not going to find it at work. You're going to find it in your breath. And so let's use this analogy, the reflection, the thing, you can't see your face, you know. So we can say that's water. Because back then, you didn't have a mirror. You'd have to seek a deep, calm body of water, a pond. Not a river, it's moving too quickly. And not a gutter, it's a mess. So you have to find this pond and look at yourself, right? As an analogy. But if that pond 
is the water that reveals, and it, technically in traditional Chinese medicine, water does belong to your highest nature. It's an interesting piece. Uh, you can't see, even if you're at that pond and you're splashing and throwing pebbles in it, which are all thoughts, imputations, stuff, you still don't see yourself because it's turbid water. So to create that deep, calm water in which you can truly see your reflection, you must create tranquility to produce the clarity. The tranquility is a byproduct of regulated breath. So what I want to do is I'm going to give you all of this stuff, but I'm most importantly, I want to give you something you can take home today to change the quality of your life from here on forward. And that is a foolproof method in which you can create tranquility, experience the clarity, to see the root power of your highest nature. Because that's the strange you're going to be looking at upon death anyways. That's you. That's how you came in. That's how you're going to leave. So it would be really good to know yourself so that you're not looking at a stranger when you get there. And so the more we can go into tranquility and clarity, the more we can see the real nature that is before and after all of your stuff. So how do we do it? Well, firstly, know that the average person does not have regulated breath. The average person is going to exhale maybe longer than they inhale and inhale, and it's all over the place, and it's really, really governed. Do you want to see it perfectly? Look at a 14-year-old girl. Do you want to see the most turbid creature on the planet? Look at a 14-year-old girl. And it's because of the hormones. And they get, you know, oh my, this is my purpose, really, and I got no choice. You can't quit. Does that make any sense? You will menstruate. You will go through this suffering. God's got you. And this is it. And they're all, you can be, I'm in, a, I'm in Hawaii, you know, I live there in the summer, I'm walking down, and there she is on the beach with her parents. <laughs> no, really. And it's the breath, right? The breath will show you that because that's a, it's so deep. There's such a, a circus in her head. They call it turbidity of the forehead screen. Like this is your forehead, right? Inside your mind. And these are false thoughts and imputations, right? And remember how we were talking about the deep seated, displaced reaction? Well, that's in your cell, cellular memory. It's deep in your cells. That has to be displaced and removed. But it's not. So she's just sitting there. Nothing. No one's even talking to her. You've seen it. You may have even been there. First. So your breath is, is actually affected by your thoughts. Therefore, your thoughts can be affected by your breath. It's the only way in. It's the key into your root power of your true nature. Regulating breath. So what do we do? There's so many methods. The easiest method, and we're going to share this with you, is inhaling and exhaling out of your nose. Now people are like, but I can't. It's, it's okay. Inhale from your mouth, exhale out of your nose. That'll work. And after a while, if you can't inhale and exhale out of your nose, it's because there's been so much what they call fire rising that this is completely dehydrated. So we got to get the water, like a baby, if you're going to see a baby, they're juicy as anything. Their eyes, their nose, their mouth, they're very juicy. And then you see the guy standing on line with his mouth open. <laughs> his eyes barely blink, they're so sticky. It's like, wow. So that's not juicy. So what we want to do is bring the water up. Because there's a fundamental elemental you know, misappreciation here. All of our water as we age, if you will, drops down. It's called damp, turbid, phlegm. And it affects digestion, elimination, procreation, everything. It's just phlegm. Cold phlegm. This just should be hot stomach and a cool head. But everybody's opposite. Hot head, cold, clammy stomach, cold, clammy feet. Oops. You want a cool head, hot feet. Fire below, water above. How do we do it? Breathing once again. So by closing your mouth, Inhaling with the tongue on the roof of your mouth. Do it as I'm talking and do a little experiment. And as you exhale, drop your tongue. Okay, so we've got to get involved in the physiology of breathing first. What's going to happen 
is again, the nervous system is kind of stupid to a certain degree. It thinks you're eating. You'll start to salivate. And automatically, you'll start to moisten your, your, your sinuses, your throat, your mouth. Very, very important piece. Okay? Uh, we get a lot of inner ear issues. We got a lot of vertigo, a lot of stuff. And that's uh, brought on by the excess fire. So the simple, silly act of inhaling with the tongue over your mouth, exhaling, drop it, after about 30 breaths, you should have moisture. Okay? So that's one piece. Next step is as you're inhaling and exhaling, we're going to teach you how to regulate and time the breath. And I'll, I'll do it in a minute here. And that's using music. So we use what I was trained with. It's not as sexy, but it works. This. <clears throat> this is called a temple block. Did you ever see one of these? Looks kind of like a cheeseburger, I know. And so especially when you're hungry. You're sitting there meditating for a couple of days and there's the teacher. All you see is a burger. <laughs> you don't even hear this anymore. You're just looking at the burger. I know that's not enlightened, but it's my personal experience. You know, and it even starts to look good. Like so, but this is just sort of That's it. And you wait, and then there's another poor soul that goes like this on the fourth beat. Okay? So we, I started this, uh, produced music, so that not all of you living in an ashram or a temple where you're going to find a couple of guys with a bell in a temple block. It's not going to happen. So we put it together. Temple block, one, two, three, four, bang, one, two, and so 60 beats per minute because you're going to uh, sympathize with that. You're going to sink with that. All of a sudden, your heart rate will drop. Nice, 60 beats a minute, resting heart rate. It'll follow. It. And then you're going to inhale one, two, three, four, and you'll exhale one, two, three, four. And the simple act of regulating in and out, even 15 minutes, it's kind of like setting your timing belt. Affect your whole day. Crisis, go to your breath. You know, it's like, oh God, Aunt Minnie's coming. And it's like, yeah. She makes you nuts. She's always insulting your cooking. So you you just breathe. Okay? That's a real powerful way to regulate your emotions. So what we have done is produced all kinds of music actually based on a pentatonic scale to because these notes, remember we're talking about cellular memory? And so if you have this, you know, rage, E is nice, because that's good for the liver. So the C is good for spleen, believe it or not. These notes vibrate, the world's a vibration. So we use notes, we use a temple block, and we use a bell, and you simply listen to it. And the music is $90 a CD, no it's not, it's free. You can download it, right, the pitch, not the pitch, no pitch, download the music. It's great. It's you know it's it's free, and um, but that's how we one of the tools we use is regulating the breath to regulate the emotion. Now a flute, you'll never get a note out of that flute, so it's a complete waste of time for you. Just to fill the thing with your breath is crazy. It's a big hollow piece of bamboo, but that would be a very advanced way because you must fully exhale. Must. Fully in there. You can't, as soon as you think about something, your breath is gone, the note is gone. So it's like a yoke, you know, just holding you on to presence. And that's what we call a skillful means to find the now. We do it with movement because then we'll say, okay, I have this one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, two, one. You, you see it? Now you move the body in four, four times, 60 beats a minute with coordinated breath. If you think about one thing that's disturbing, you fall off the way. That's it. So you train, lock your mind into now through breath and movement. That's what the whole Qigong, Tai Chi paradigm is really about. It's moving meditation. And we use that to control the unwanted movement of that wind. So now it's not a random breeze. Whoosh, wow. 
crazy breezes. No, nope, it's it's a consistent summer breeze that you want. That's not going to knock leaves off the tree and start snapping branches. We want wind. It's going to be stagnant. We want emotions. So what are we dead? We have to have something. But wouldn't it be nice to have a summer breeze as opposed to a tsunami? So that so we can choose that. We can choose this reality. But the problem is, it's not a pill. It's not, you know, I, I don't have a, a, a potion to sell you. It's something you have to actively do. And so therefore, I mean, it's becoming more popular. But especially when we're in the depth of our you know, allopathic medicine paradigm, no one's into it. Just give me a pill because I have anxiety. Yeah, but all of the contraindications, you're better off suffering with the anxiety. We have, what are they saying? It's like we're addicted to opioids and mm -hmm. all kinds of things. It's sad. We take a good thing and we turn it into a bad thing. That's how we grow. So regulating the wind as it goes through those leaves and affects that tree is the key to regulating all of the emotions that belong to these individual leaves. It really is that simple. Before I just keep barreling through this stuff, questions or observations, or is there anything you'd like me to expound upon? I've got another 10 hours worth of information, and I've got a half hour. Yes? When you're practicing the relaxation agreement, yep. what is to prevent you from hyperventilating? Well, if you're going like this, <laughs> you'll probably hyperventilate. So nothing will prevent that. But if this, watch this. There's nothing hyperventilating at all. You can't hyperventilate. You're actually regulating. It's the opposite of hyperventilating. That is what is to prevent you from hyperventilating. Okay? So regulating breath. And we're going to do some of this stuff in the last 15 minutes. We're going to get right in here and practice. But that's a great question, by the way. Because some people do get worried if they're using like excess of breath. It's probably excess and deficiency are indicators of disease. Too much or too little of anything will kill you. So, you know. any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you talked about the emotions and the, the Process not involve all of the emotions, but liberating them. Yes. And is the liberation a result of, of your breath, the breath work, or is it a result of understanding? How is that liberation? You just really The way you deliver, liberal, get good, because you are awesome. You really are. But some of your behaviors, you know, it's like, I love you, but I hate the crazy shit you do. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's a lot of that, okay? So what we like to do is, you see this in relationships all the time. So that we want to throw the baby out with the water. So you got to understand if that person has that much right anger, that's also a very passionate person. You see, so if you drug that, you kill both of them. It's like a quarter. You want the heads up, not the tails up. You don't want to get rid of the quarter. So once you start to look at your nature, it's root power. Don't get rid of any of the emotions. But be sure they're positive. They add value. They plant good seeds with the good results. We need the emotions. Because all of this elemental construct has a yin and yang expression. And so a lot of times we think about nothing wrong with it. I'm a very emotional guy. You know, I'm passionate. My, my name is Michael Leone. With all those vowels, you gotta be really passionate. And so what am I gonna do? Turn into some distant Swede? I'll never do it. Right? We know who you are. And so, you know, you just have to you just you just have to Don't get me started on that. So, so, so but you see, so that's the trick is honoring its source. Because guess what? Underneath here, there's a root power of those emotions. And I was half tempted to make little you know, stems of the different colors. You see? Because we think, if you look at a tree, right? And I say, okay, here's a tree. Where is the most energy? On the here or here? On the bottom. A lot of people think the energy is on the top by the flower and the leaf. It's in the root. The root is where the juice is, 
right? You do herbology and things like that. It's the root. So, so it's the same. You want the root power of liver, rage, wood, is actually right action and benevolence. That's the root power. Unconscious, worry. Ah, oh, yeah, that's unconscious. Root power of earth. The ability to acquire knowledge, be very, very balanced, and very, very centered. You want the root power. So it's alchemy. In Taoism, a lot of the stuff comes from Taoism. They talk about the alchemical process of turning lead to gold. This is lead, this is gold. And so you have, you're, you're, you're transforming. You're going through inner transformation. And usually by the time you hit 58, this has gone so far that these leaves start to drop. And so now the real work becomes the alchemical process of first finding your root power and then next leaving behind more than an inheritance, which the government will take half anyways. You have to leave behind seeds, if you will, if you want to use a tree analogy, of wisdom, love, benevolence, and respect for the generation, starting with your own family and everyone around you. That's what your real contribution is, not your stuff, but the impact you have on humanity. And that's where the, the wise sage piece comes in. So you don't get rid of them, you cultivate them. Does that help? That's a great question. Any other questions? That's one to follow up on. Yes? Yeah, that's a great question. So, yes and no. <laughs> okay. What was it? Is there, is there any interest from the younger people to understand this level of, let's say, cultivation? We're really trying to go through and have what they call meaningful life. Life isn't about stuff. You know, who has the most stuff wins? It's not. So, yes and no. That's why we have the dirty trick of warrior, scholar, sage. So usually from you know, 8 to about 21, it's all warrior. We don't talk too much about this. We talk about discipline. Because it takes power, which in power will express itself in discipline and self-respect. has to be fostered first. So I started as a child. This was not the conversation. The conversation was shut up. And stay like this for a half hour, or I will actually hit you with something. And that's how I stayed, you know, in a million other horrible positions, to basically earn the capacity to have enough discipline and self respect to see these things and implement them. You cannot plant seeds on concrete. So the first phase is warrior. We teach them, also, there's a thing called ancestral chi that comes in with these jack with all of us. So you have to burn the ancestral chi out. Remember we talking about cellular memory we acquire through experiences in this life? And so you'll have a propensity to overreact to things. Well, you, because of your ancestors, came in with a thing called ancestral chi. Meaning, you know, I have a propensity to drive a convertible Eldorado, right? And be a bit of a, you know, Chicago and hey, how you doing? Well, that doesn't always add value. But that did come in with my culture. So I have to burn out some of my cultural influence, or lack thereof. So during that time, you amend soil, and you teach them discipline. You, you cut, we all had to wear the same uniform, no class. You're not rich, you're not from the Italian neighborhood, you're not from this, you're all wearing the same robe. We're going to even monitor the way you speak. As a matter of fact, when you come in, you're going to say, hello, sir, how are you, is there anything you needed? And that's it. And you'll stand at attention until you're told to stand at ease. And you won't sit down unless you're told to have a seat. And you'll learn what they call the black belt attitude of respect. you got to first, you, you've been past that or you wouldn't be here. But the kids, you, and then you got to give them what they want. What do they want? Power. What kind of power? External power. What do you mean? I wanted to learn a double flying kick and I would move two broadswords and be the toughest kid in my high school. And I was. Then they had my ear. But you got to give the child what they need first, so that they have enough confidence to go through what it takes to give what they need, to give them what they want first, so they have enough confidence to go through what it takes to give what they need. So it's a flip. You gotta earn their trust. But you really have to teach them almost break them. And 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 then and not because they want to learn about a meaningful life, 
and their legacy and how they're going to affect humanity. They want to be ripped. They want the hot chicks to dig them. They want to be tough. They want to, and you can get it, show them off, show it to them all. Teach it to them all. And that's what I did. I've tried to train thousands, thousands. That first piece, black belt attitude, the warrior. But the warrior has the strength to run into battle. But the true battle field is right here. You're going to learn self-defense? Yeah, I want to learn self-defense. My teacher would laugh all the time. He says, you have to learn how to defend yourself against yourself. You're your biggest knight. You're your biggest enemy. All your suffering comes from your ignorance. Yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like totally irrelevant. And, and it took me years to even, because he'd teach it anyways, but I didn't understand it. I really, not until I hit about 33, did I start, like little balloons started popping in my head. I go, oh, wow, really? Oh, that's what that means? But well, generally, you know, you act and wear a bathing suit in the summer. That's correct. You don't wear a parka, big jacket. So with the ch children, you catch them with what they want and prepare them for what they need. That's what I have found. And so, and then, however we come in, some of us come in with a stronger sense of their root power. Some children are born with a stronger sense of self-love. Any acting out, any crime, any bad behavior is all predicated on, hey, screw you, I'm going to take your stuff. Because you're not worth it. And you know why you're not worth it? You can't be worth anything. Why not? Because I'm not worth anything. And without self-worth, how can I see your worth? There's no way I can love you more than I love me. As a matter of fact, I love you as an illusion. I love the way you make me feel. And I can only love you as much as I love me. And so that whole thing has to start. If you want to talk about the biggest rip in our culture is the absence of self-love. That's really what it is. And so that's what you teach that generation, but you have to empower them. They have to look in the mirror and see themselves with their black belt as something powerful. And like, oh, check this out. I can do this. This is good. Therefore, I'm good. Fine. We'll do that. And so that's why they need any type of music, anything in which they can cultivate a little bit of their root power. It helps them see how awesome they are. As a teacher, a master instructor, I've spent years looking at people, and they're looking at the broken branches and falling leaves, and I see an amazing root structure. I'm far more impressed with my clients than they are. That's really what it is. And so you got to like, okay, I know human potential. This is my bag. You have all of this, and you're blinded by that. So I have to reveal your nature. And that's what we do with everyone. With the children, it's discipline first. Almost like, they call it mudo, martial art, you know, sir, yes, sir, kind of stuff, because that's, they don't have it. Especially now. I couldn't train, I don't train kids anymore. But the way I trained them in the 80s and stuff, I noticed that by 1995, I was out. Because I had parents complaining that I had their little puffy dumpling of a boy do a couple of push-ups. I'm like, you know what? He's fired. You're fired. Screw you. Get out of my school. I don't like this. And I'm not going to have this little chubby asthmatic whiner in my get off my ass. I'm not doing it. You know, and so it's just we were, that's very depressing. So that's a whole other conversation we talk about. Does that help? <laughs> so, but yes, they can and uh, we have centers, United Martial Arts Schools, that teach warrior. Then at about, uh, you know, in the 30s, we teach scholar, which is basically, you know what, there's a thing called energetic anatomy and physiology, and there's acupressure points, and these are where your organs are. You know, how many ribs do you have? How many, you know, vertebrae do you have? Put your hand on your liver. They don't even know. <laughs> it's like, so then we start going into know the, the machine, and then the final pace is sage, which is know the nature of your mind and ultimately the nature of reality and the opportunity and the value of life itself. And that's kind of the, if you start with that, you're not going to get it. Because I know that's what I experienced. Any other questions? Very good question. Okay, let's do this now. Let's get ready and do some stuff. Uh, I'm going to share with you another awesome little secret. Dealing with emotions, creating a wind screen. 
So, because sometimes you're in a storm. You're in a storm. It's like, really? And it's going bad. So what we do is, yes, you regulate your breath, but you can also regulate your, let's say, energetic intake of the situation by using a thing called the inner smile. So between the inner smile and regulated breath, you have everything it takes to make it through your next family holiday. You know what I mean? So, in, in mine, I mean, they actually will actually fist fight and stuff. So, you really got to keep your, your middle here. So, let's talk about the inner smile and how that helps. Okay, if you see somebody like this, that's stress. You can see it in the face, the eyeballs are pointing in, right? The brow is down, the eyebrows are touching. And what's happening is my kidneys are pouring out of my face because the kidney is your life force energy. Okay? So a lot of times the way we like engage with people creates a drain. And there's people that know it, feed off of it. You all know something like that, right? Little energy vampires and they just suck the life of you. Yeah. And they know how to play. They're good. Real good. And so one, regulate your breath. And two, now use this thing called an inner smile. And this is why the opposite of this is this. Drawing energy in and not letting them sap your energy and psychologically and emotionally shift you. So these are two emotional you know, weapons we can use. A shield and a sword. The sword is cutting through. That's the wind. The shield is the inner smile. The inner smile is very simple. You take the corners of your mouth and you bring them as far to the side as you can. Like the right corner, you know, you don't physically have to do it. And the right side of your mouth reaches for your right earlobe, which is impossible. The left side reaches for your left, and I know that. But what that's going to do is stop this and start that. And now, this is another impossibility. Your right pupil looks at your right ear. Your left pupil looks at your left ear. Not going to happen. But what it's going to do is open your, literally open up your face energetically. Lift the corners slightly. Not a crazy joker smile because they'll be on you. <laughs> you know, and you can't do that. So it's chill. You know, it's just a chill smile. You're just, it's called the inner smile. And by relaxing your face first, bringing them up or out and up, bringing them out, then relaxing your chest because this is what happens. <laughs> and that's that guy, it's the troll. And it's tense. So you gotta melt the shoulders, uh, relax the face, then go down. There's a point called liver 14, point called stomach 24, whatever, floating ribs and navel. Experience that opening too. Now what happens is you become open and receptive. Because this is what's gonna happen. If I come to you and say, hey, listen, I don't like redheads. And and then now wah wah wah. And you're gonna <laughs> you know, you're gonna rah, and it's all gonna come, and you've got this whole thing, and you're you're dying for me to shut up so you can get your word in edgewise. Right? You always gotta get the last word in, god damn it. Well that's because you're all rah, like a fire hose shooting back at the person. There should be no word. There is no last word because there was no first word. That was no word. It's just space. I'm here, I'm listening, but I have no inner nothing, no inner dialogue. That's a big secret in dealing with emotions. Now, I learned this, all these things, as a warrior, because we fought. It's part of it. You physically fight. And we fought with swords and spears. I just got scars on my hands. I'll show them to you. And you can't be like this. You're done. You're actually done before the first cut. You have to... And you don't even look at the dude. You just chill. And I'm not worried about what I'm going to do next. There's nothing in my mind. It's going to be in response to what he did. Emptiness. Or you are done. Because if he can go like, and you go, you're done. And that's what I would do sometimes if I wanted to be evil. I'd see if they're going to move. In other words, what's going on with their head? If I'm in their head, I already won. Now you're like a cat playing with a mouse. So it's the same thing with negotiation. So there's inner smile, regulated breath, no internal dialogue. And that's how you make it through. That's how I make it through plane travel. I can't stand it. So I'm just all, I train the whole time. I have to, 
because otherwise this guy's going to show up and I'm going to wind up in a federal penitentiary. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, it's, it's so insane and corrupt. I just, I, if I start to think about it, because I'm, you know, I'm a bit of a rage guy. So, you know, that's that. So these are our secrets. Regulated breath, relax the face, no internal dialogue. Now we'll do five minutes. Let's break out the music. I brought my bass. I'm going to be playing some old blues. That probably will work out. We're just going to do one song. And so this is what I, what I suggest doing, is we're going to uh, inhale and exhale. Wait for the bell. Inhale till you hear the bell. Exhale till you hear the bell. You can close your eyes. You can look at nothing. Relax the shoulders. Keep the mouth closed if you can. If not, inhale through the mouth. Exhale through the nose. Keep everything relaxed. We'll do five minutes, and uh, I'm sure you'll do it. That will work. Can you hear the bell? Let's see. A little louder, I think. <laughs> we have uh, the shocky bound one. There we go. That will work. That's very basic. This is track one. Okay. Relax. Put your hands anywhere. Then begin following the bell. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Success? Oh, yeah. Pretty good, right? And that's uh, just me with the flute, the bell, and the thing. And, and then it becomes way more sophisticated, you know? But what's happening is that's first level. And you can do that every day in the morning before you start your day. And that's really a, a good way to do it because you kind of set a tone, you know, for your day. You can do it at the end of the day. You can do it. Whatever works, you know, it's like the diet, you don't go back, you know, it feels natural. Questions or observations? Yes. Question. Uh, I know you can do it more, like I do it to eight, so I double that. But how far should a person go in learning to deep breathe? Did I tell you to do it too? You could uh, ask it. <laughs> five minutes per breath. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> how, 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 that's my point. Oh, no. Just, Five Whatever minutes to do yourself. one breath. No, couldn't do that. But that's how far you can go. So what I do is you'll be introduced to sipping methods. Like even that, I did three bells of breath. And I was just chilling. But usually I'll, I'll sip, and I'll sip, and I'll sip, and I'll sip again. And I'll keep sipping for two minutes. And then I'll exhale, and I'll exhale, and I'll exhale. I'll exit for two minutes. That's five minute breath. And so that's the first step in self mastery. Start with four seconds. The average person can just do one bell. Just they've been, never done this. Just a little measure. Just one measure. Inhale, then exhale. Oh, you know what? I'm pretty good with this. Okay, maybe inhale for two bells and exhale for two bells. The regular person, when I try for 12, 16. You, who knows? You do what's good for you. How do I know what's good for me? Don't pass out. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you see, 
Well, if you start with one measure, maybe two measures, you'll know. You'll know your body. Yeah. Have fun with it. Yeah. This isn't Catholic school. Don't <laughs> <laughs> go to hell here. You're welcome. Enjoy it. Yes. Okay. Two bells, and then three bells, and then one bell. Does it throw Regulated. everything off? Yeah. Mary, you're coming in. You can deepen it, but if you start off with you know one measure, which is a bell, you know what I mean? You might be able to bring it to two, but don't drop down to one. Try to keep deepening it, you know, before you know it. What I do is I'll start off like that, and then for the first half hour, it's technically 25 minutes, regulate all five elements, and then I'm done. And I stop breathing. And I stop thinking, and I look up, and it's been two and a half hours. Because you can't just drop in to tranquility. You try, it won't work. So you, you ease it. So you gotta go easy. Yes? So how do you know when you can Yeah, that's really good. When there's no mind movement. Okay, and again, we're, okay. I'm doing a uh, real like, like now you're asking the good questions. I'm doing like a two-day intensive where we're going to go through all of this. Like even that music that you were listening to belonged to negating fear. That was a droning E, vibrating the liver and the gallbladder and dealing with all concerns. You see it? I'm going to explain all of this in minutia, you know, during those two days. Uh, so, you know, if you really want to you know, go down the rabbit hole. But how do you know that you've reached tranquility when there are no senses? We have to... Ears belong to water, eyes belong to wood, the tongue, speech, is fire, uh, you see what's going on in the mouth, movement and birth. You see it, lungs, nose, smell, no eyes, no ears, no nose, no mouth. Seal the five senses, which are these moving leaves, which drain your root power, and be left with the sixth sense, the one, activating the sixth chakra. No eyes, no ears, no nose. See, we believe existence is based on our senses. We're addicted to the five. They call them the five thieves. But what you'll discover, if you turn off the five, you're still alive, and there's the sixth. So when you, and then usually, you know, time goes, body goes, everything goes. You're conscious, you, you, know, if you, you know what you're doing? You're practicing being dead. I mean, I know it sounds bizarre, because we assume life consciousness is running through form, which are the five. It's like a device that has five applications, you know, apps on your device. And we're like, oh, this is life. No, it's not. You're experiencing this bio device, and you're addicted to it. You actually are tricked into thinking that this is you at the top of the tree. You're like, guess what, guys? Turn all that off. You're still here. And that's the trick. Seal the five and reveal the one. And that's it. And you keep it. And that's a big part, especially after 58 and definitely after 83. Preparing for your future, which is death and all of eternity. And realizing that you're just consciousness momentarily residing in form. And then, okay, we do actually, if you get into this, we have like a whole self mastery journey where you can practice <coughs> dropping into these different states of, if you will, altered consciousness, heightened consciousness. So, but that's very old. It's, you know, people are starting to become more, you know, we've all had moments when, during trauma, when time is altered, you know, or, you know, you can even leave the body in trauma, but that's free. You can earn it. It doesn't have to be trauma, and you can still leave the body. You can still alter time, deliberately. We just do it based, again, on the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system kicking in and the autonomic nervous system, oh, yeah, but you can actually do it through breath. So, and it's a good thing to do because, you know, I used to say this to people when they really took offense, you know, like I'd do like a letter or a card or an email back and I'd always say, you know, die well. And they're like, what the hell? What are you? <laughs> so I stopped. I don't like that. <laughs> no one gets dying well. But the die well is without resistance, attachment, or judgment. And being so used to letting go of the senses that you don't go out in a state of trauma. You know, and so preparing for that is not <clears throat> the moment of death. So you can only live as well as you can die. So there's this whole thing, you know, that we get involved in. Any other questions? 
Did you learn something? So I wanted to make it a lecture. I really wanted to impart something that can maybe change the quality of your life and plant a good seed that affects you and may grow and, you know, physically teach you something as well. So it's not just some passive lecture. Uh, you have a good start. Uh, we have found that sometimes it's not that easy to go right into meditation because of the cellular memory that we're talking about. So that's why we do the Qigong and Tai Chi. So we'll do all the Qigong movements to that. So now my body is involved. So because a lot of times our bodies revolt. Do you see what I'm saying? You get a little this, a little twitchy, a little uncomfortable, this circulation there. And the body is running the show. And so by doing the Qigong, we start, you know, okay, I might not be the tree, but I can control the tree. I miss experiencing that. So if you really want to see yourself in that reflection and some of the aspects of your nature that aren't really adding value to the quality of your life and the lives around you, it's easier to see the fact that your feet aren't aligned than the fact that you're closed-minded and selfish. You know what I mean? People don't like that. But they'll take this advice. Yeah, I can do that. We can take a physical movement critique, but as soon as we start pointing at the ego, shields and swords come. And so that's, you know, just how it is. So we get you used to cultivating and cutting away that which doesn't serve you on a physical level first. And then you have more confidence in your ability and you start seeing some of the more dynamic parts of your root nature. It gives you confidence to go through the necessary <laughs> ego death to get rid of the pulp or the leaves. It's an interesting process. Any other questions? Yes. Um, you were talking about being confronted with that anger. In that case, when you do fall on your face and you have the inner smile, <laughs> have you found that to incense the person who's angry? Well, if you're good, see, okay. Sometimes people are angry because they want your energy. Yes. And so, uh, you, you, you know what I mean? I know that. And they want the fight. Yeah. And the last thing they need you is owning. Right. You know, they're not, that's going to go really bad. So you can't be turning into some guru out of it. So what I usually find is I create space. I redirect and deflect, usually with humor or a fake phone call, and get the hell out of there. Yeah. <laughs> if it's like that. Because, you know, again, my family, you will get stabbed, yeah. you know, which is nuts. So, and they know who I am, and they're on all my tricks. So I, I, I gotta get out. I create space. The best thing you can do, the only way you can deal with unconsciousness, you know, dealing with the unconscious, the energetic vampire, space. That's why when I get in, I'm a human, and I'll have, you know, you have conflicts, and I'm like, listen, dude, we're gonna need to put some space in this. I love you, you mean a lot, but all we're gonna do now, Make it worse. Space. And then, <laughs> now, space. You know, because you're just feeding the demon right now. So, you gotta be careful not to get drawn in to the demon. Any other questions before we close? Yes, ma'am. You speak of this mastery course. Yeah. And the piece we've been handed is this what you're referring to? Yeah, this is. On Saturdays and Sundays? Yeah, this is the Chief Fit Weekend. See, we do, I do these online, and we have clients literally all over the world, and they come here. This is the headquarters, and they have this experience. And we do a two-week, five-elemental overview. Two I mean, two-day, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> because I do do a two-week one. That's not this, you know, you can move in. I mean, we go that far. It's a thousand hours to get you really like, wow, I want to, you know, I, I sold all my stuff. I moved in. I literally did. You can't do that. But, you know, you probably passed living in an ashram. <laughs> but, you know, uh, at least what you can learn over the course of that two days, I can explain to you that, you know what, there's energy, and that's called chi, and there's different qualities of chi. You know what, it's got to be balanced. That's called yin and yang. There's spaces of yin and yang. And they run through these five. If you can understand what yin and yang is, what chi is, and what the five elements are, you have enough understanding of the language and subject matter to study this for the rest of your life. 
just that class is an initiation, sure, you can keep going, but if you buy books, has anybody ever bought any books on this stuff? It's crazy. If you don't know it, it's just jumbo. And they'll always tell you, seek a teacher. Because the teacher initiates you and teaches you the language. So what my main goal is on the Chi Fit Weekend is you'll learn all the physical movements, the basic Qigong restoration protocol. You'll learn how to use different healing sounds for these emotions and do different exercises to basically remove the cellular memory and the theory. So it's as much information as I can pack into 16 hours as possible. And uh, it took me many years to gather the information. So if you're not in a position where you could, you know, move in, then at least, you know, visit for the weekend and give it a try. I I'd recommend it. Yes, well, where is this? Right here. Oh, it's here. Yes. Well, from like 9 to 4 or something. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I do them uh, week-long ones. I just did one in New England. We do them in Hawaii. We do them all over the place. But this one is happens to be that the place where I'm at, and so we do them a couple of times a year right here for the locals. It's it's not on here, I guess not. Saturday and Sunday, October twenty first and twenty second. That's not on. But yeah, good. Any other questions? Okay, everybody, I appreciate you taking your Saturday. It's good to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you.